Have mercy, Sid, ye longest of beards. Anonymous, Poema de Mio Sid. Hello again. Let's continue analyzing Cervantes' masterpiece. In chapter 33, Don Quixote has left to take a siesta, and Sancho passes the time in the company of the Duchess and her retinue of maidens and duenas. It's a fascinating scene that offers intimate access to the thoughts of Sancho as well as those of the Duchess. It also contains political lessons. The Duchess insists that Sancho take a seat of honor at her side. She then gives Sancho a trial run at governing, and he presides like a medieval Spanish hero over courts of women. She told him to be seated like a governor and to speak like a squire, given that for both roles, he deserved the ivory throne of El Cid Ruy Diaz Campeador. Is this mockery of our misogynistic squire? Or is there a deeper, more feminist message here about the need for humility against the excesses of power? Keep in mind that the Cid was essentially king of Valencia and that upon his death, his wife Jimena assumed the throne. So the metaphorical politics of the novel continue to allude to the dynamics of the Morisco question. When the Duchess challenges Sancho regarding his lie to Don Quixote about his embassy to see Dulcinea during his master's penance in the Sierra Morena, Sancho confesses the truth. After checking behind the room's wall hangings for spies, Sancho reveals that he considers his master to be a complete madman and an idiot. Did you know? Tapestries, which were among the most elaborate and expensive works of art in the early modern period, were deployed at the court of the monarchs and nobles in order to display the wealth, power, and cultural capital of these patrons. He also brags about his more recent embassy to El Toboso, by which he has convinced Don Quixote that Dulcinea is enchanted. At this point, the Duchess expresses her doubts about Sancho's ability to govern by way of a veiled reference to Plato's allegory of the cave. If Sancho knows his master is insane and yet still serves him, then the squire has proven himself unable to govern himself, and thus, how will he know how to govern others? Amazingly, the Duchess reports her doubts by quoting an inner voice that speaks to her. This narrative structure of Miss in a Beam, or a kind of Russian doll arrangement, signals that the Duchess is adept at a complex game of discursive frames. By this alone, she is, like Camilla in the 1605 novel, one of the most complex characters in the entire novel. And the Duchess's complexity grows. Sancho soon yields to her power, for she gets him to confess that he truly admires Don Quixote, I love him much, and that he is loyal and even indebted to him. He gave me his donkeys. Sancho even appears prepared to renounce his governorship, arguing that politics corrupts the soul. And if your highness should not wish that I be granted the promised governorship, it might be that not granting me it will redound in favor of my conscience. And it might even be that Sancho the squire will sooner go to heaven than Sancho the governor. The squire recovers by insisting that all people are the same. He does this via a series of refrains that range from a general racial equivalency, by night all cats are brown, to something much more politically specific. The prince travels the same narrow path as the day laborer, and the pope's body needs no larger grave than the sacristan. Sancho concludes this socially leveling speech by referring to a famous legend of medieval Spain according to which King Rodrigo was eaten by snakes. Notice how Sancho has descended into a castration nightmare. Doña Rodriguez delights at this, citing the ballad of the penitence of King Rodrigo. Now they're biting me, they're biting me now, right where I'm most sinful. Recall that Don Quixote has recently compared Dulcinea to La Cava the woman raped by King Rodrigo, an act for which he was punished not only by having his penis eaten by snakes, but by losing Spain to the Moors. Quixotic Mission What signals the complexity of the Duchess to the reader of part two of Don Quixote de la Mancha? A. Her Santiago cake. 
B. Her submission to the Duke. C. Her interrogation of Sancho. Correct answer, C. Her interrogation of Sancho. With Sancho reduced, figuratively knocked off his throne, now the Duchess, like a Medici queen, takes full control of the conversation. First, she marks herself as the key to Sancho's rise in status. She assures Sancho that her husband will keep his word regarding the promised isle, and she counsels him to not discriminate among his subjects. What I charge him with is to take care in governing his vassals, remembering that all of them are loyal and well-born. This is serious moral advice in contrast to Sancho's diabolical Mikomikon fantasy. Finally, with subtle reasoning, the Duchess turns the tables on Sancho by inverting his trick on his master. She insists that it was actually the squire who was fooled by enchanters. I take it as certain and more than verified that what Sancho imagined to be his idea of tricking his master and making him think that the peasant girl was Dulcinea was all for its part the idea of one of the great enchanters who pursued Don Quixote. Because really and truly, and from good sources, I have it that the peasant girl who made the leap onto the donkey was and is Dulcinea of Toboso, and that our good Sancho, thinking himself the trickster, is the tricked. And when we least expect it, we will see her in her proper form, and then Sancho will awaken from the illusion in which he lives. Remember the significance of Sancho's intermittent ass in relation to the Mikomikon plot in part one? After Sancho accepts the Duchess's vision of life as an infinitely complex illusion, the chapter ends with Sancho kissing the Duchess's hand and urging her to take care of his ass. And he implored her to do him the favor of taking good care of his gray because he was the light of his eyes. Sancho then recalls his conflict with Doña Rodriguez over the care of his Rucio, as well as a certain unnamed misogynistic Hidalgo in his hometown. Oh Lord have mercy and how bad off with these ladies once was a certain Hidalgo of my town. In a shocking transgression of decorum, the Duchess promises to take excessive care of Sancho's ass. I will value him more than the pupils of my own eyes. Finally, the Duchess even suggests that Sancho take his ass with him to his island. The squire agrees taking a final swipe at those who govern. For I have seen more than two asses go into government, and so taking mine would not be anything new. That's all for now. Find out what happens with our characters in our next discussion of this fascinating text. Once again, Cervantes is counterculture. Whoa, 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 wait. This is my space. Once again, Cervantes is countercultural with respect to his time by advancing feminist ideas. If you want to subscribe to our YouTube channel, click here. To enroll in our course, click here. Also, please follow us on our social media. Thank you.